Well, I want to speak to you this morning on spiritual formation, focusing on the word formation, and uh, the crux of it is the aspect of spiritual formation. We're in this current series, um, I think it's the third week in, this, in the current series, uh, which is linked to reformation, understanding the spirit of reformation, and the sub-series within that is um, on the Church of Acts, on the keynote features of the Church of Acts. And the book of Acts, oh, that's the early church, the book of Acts gives us this uh, lovely view, this peek into the early church and how it operated, the structures of the early church, the happenings of the early church, the spirit of the early church, the energy of the early church, um, and, and a lot of the focus is on the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the promise which came in, um, recorded for us in Acts chapter 2, and how that completely, completely changed the scenery. It completely changed the landscape of how people gathered and how the church came together and how new social orders were created and social structures and economic structures and all of that. So it's still a, 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 an excellent and a relevant blueprint for us. But just um, receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit or knowing about the Holy Spirit or knowing there is the Spirit of God, which is all basics we know. But I want to talk about the formation of the Spirit inside of us. There has to be a process. There has to be a galvanizing. Uh, there has to be something that takes place in us for, for us to be reformed. And there's going to be a lot of play on words. But for us to be reformed and for spiritual formation to take place inside of us so that each and every one of us and then all of us corporately will function as the church, that emerging church upon the earth. Now, um, I think I must say firstly that if, if you try to Google the term uh, spiritual formation, or you may have heard of, of it, it's a very popular term in theological circles. And you'll find numerous articles written on spiritual formation. But I just want to caution here that uh, those articles are where the whole concept of spiritual formation was born was actually within uh, institutionalized church structures such as um, the Catholic Church where priests would be trained to go into ministry within the institutionalized churches and um, they would learn lots of theory. It was a very structured program. So it's a very theoretical training, very theological training. And then there was the, the identified need that uh, there's a spiritual aspect that these priests require to have. So part of the curriculum, if you want to call it, was a module on spiritual formation. And already we can start to see um, some flaws in that approach uh, because we know that spirituality or the baptism of the Holy Spirit or operating in the Spirit or the words that uh, Pastor Clive used, uh, the invocation, being led by the Spirit, is not going to come through attending a theoretical course on spiritual formation. It's not going to come through doing some research and presenting a mini dissertation or a thesis on uh, spiritual formation. It comes from relationship. It comes uh, from having a hunger for the spirit. It comes from living a certain lifestyle. Uh, it comes from a life of devotion to prayer, fasting, all of the disciplines. 
It comes from how we relate to one another. Okay, so this is all of the things that I'll just lay an introduction to in terms of how spiritual formation takes place in us. It's not a theoretical thing. It's not something that we can do as a module. It's, 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 it's deeper than that because God can't be studied just academically. Now, I'm not saying that we must become lazy and not read up. Yes, there's many things that we can read and research. Uh, obviously, the Bible will be our primary source. And then there are secondary sources. But the fullness of the Spirit of God, the formation of the Spirit within each and every one of us is not an academic exercise. It's a spiritual exercise in itself. It's based on hunger and thirst and seeking after God, righteous living and all of those, those things. Okay? So the spiritual formation that I alluded to first, which is an academic exercise, is not what I'm uh, going to be speaking about today. Okay, we wanna go, we, we're going to go deeper than that. We want the heart of God, not the heart of some academic who wrote a paper. You understand? We want the heart of God. Authenticity. Why take something that's secondary when we can get to the source, to the primary source? Let's get to the primary source first. Um, we know that, for example, on the day of Pentecost, um, when, when the Spirit of, of God, the Holy Spirit, came in that mighty rushing wind, it was dramatic. Uh, those people, that 120 people that were, were in that room, uh, all they were doing there was just being obedient. They never went on a, on, on a course or a program. All they were doing is obedient to what the Lord said to them, wait in Jerusalem until the promise. That faith, that position of trust, that position of faith put them into the environment where the Holy Spirit came in. And that's what we need to do, is to create an environment for formation of the Spirit inside of us. The second thing why we, we, we're not studying spiritual formation in, in that academic way, uh, because as I said, that whole program, course, information, whatever it is, was for the clergy only. Because the, the institutionalized churches saw this big gap between the clergy, those employed in full-time ministry, so to speak, and the laity, the people. Now you know that we don't see it that way. We believe in the priesthood of all believers, that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. And we know that the Holy Spirit is a promise that's given to all of us. So when I, spoke, when I speak about spiritual formation here today, it's something that can happen in every single one of us and should be happening in every single one of us, even children. I think um, from the reports that we've received from talking to some of the young people that have been to camp last week, I've also mentioned, mentioned that. If, if, if the young people and the leadership want to know what happened there last week, I think we saw the start of spiritual formation taking place in our young people. You see? And, and, and as that bulls and bulls and bulls, we're going to see the maturity, the, the spiritual maturity of our young people. And that would be one of the greatest things for us to witness. One of the greatest things for us to witness when we look at it in the context of a world that is dying and a world that is losing an entire generation of young people, and when we see spiritual formation taking place in, our, in, in, in the young people of the church, then we know that there's hope. <laughs> we can be a bit more optimistic than we are right now. <laughs> okay, there's hope. Spiritual formation must take place. Okay. So where does spiritual formation then fit in <clears throat> as far as we are, are concerned? Well, after the, 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 the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, uh, and it filled this room, which would have been a, a rather ordinary room, 
and settled upon and filled the inhabitants of that room, which also would have been rather ordinary people. They were not elitist or special in any way. They were there in Jerusalem for the time. They were asked to remain. They were gathered. We know that the environment was right. They were in one accord. Uh, there was no division amongst them. A few chapters, well, not a few. There was only one chapter before chapter 2. But it says that they were also praying. So we have this group of people that's in prayer, in one accord, and the Holy Spirit comes in. But it's, the, it's, it's a phenomenon that they never witnessed before. And so somebody has to, to just stand up and bring perspective. And we know that that was Peter, who stood up and he quoted a prophet. He quoted the prophet Joel, in particular chapter 2 of Joel and verse 28. And I want to read that. So let's just put that one up on the board. Uh, Joel 2 verses 28. And uh, we can use the New King James Version. He says, it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Note that word, mankind. And if it's in the New King James Version, uh, it'll say upon all flesh. Okay, that's important. And I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Now, mankind or flesh there, uh, number one, if it's mankind, this scripture does not say I will, uh, that I will pour out my spirit upon all of mankind. That means every, suddenly there's going to be a download and every human being on the planet is going to receive this, this, this download. And when it uses the word flesh, which is the same thing, it's not referring to this flesh. But what the, the flesh and mankind here is actually referring to fallen man, the fleshly nature of man, which predominated when Adam fell. Okay, So God is saying through the prophet that there's coming a time when I will pour out my spirit upon all of fallen man, the nature of man, the human nature of man, the fleshly nature of man. It's like he's saying, I'm now going to baptize the flesh. I'm going to pour out, I'm going to baptize the fleshly nature of man with my spirit. My spirit. This is the words of God. Okay. So I'm going to rectify. We're going to start turning around everything that was lost. And I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh, upon the fallen nature, the sinful nature. Because we know that after the fall, Adam started to live according to the flesh. He became a fleshly being and all mankind after him. Now God was going to pour out his spirit upon that flesh. Because we know that the flesh, again from a portion of scripture that was read today, that the fleshly nature and the spirit nature are antagonistic to each other. They are enemies of each other. Okay? They want to fight each other. So God pours his spirit out. And we're going to see now how we suppress the flesh through spiritual formation that will take place in us. And this pouring out or the baptism of the Holy Spirit will establish a new nation on the earth. Pastor Tamo explained that to us. That on the day of Pentecost, a new nation was born. A holy nation emerged upon the earth, the church of Jesus Christ. Okay. He says, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, which means even the next generation now. The sons and the daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams. Your young men will see visions. And even on the male and female servants. So, when there's a formation of the spirit, there is such an equalization that takes place. Can you see that? There's a great equalization from every generation. Then the sons and the daughters and even the servants, there's an equalization that takes place. This is what 
spiritual formation does to us individually, to us as a body. It's just going to be so amazing. And he closes by that line, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, do you believe with me that we are living in those days? That these are those days? Because that's what Peter said at the day of Pentecost. He says, this is that. He brought Joel, the prophet Joel, from the past, from the Old Testament. He brought him into relevance. He brought him into that situation by saying that this is the intent of God. We are now living in the days when God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. But that spirit must become formed inside of us. And, and I'll show you how, why the word formed just now. So we are living in those days now. The last days started in the book of Acts. This is the age of the outpouring and the infilling of the spirit. This is the days of being led by the spirit. This is, these are the days of being led by the Spirit of God. Why formation? When we think of being led by the Spirit of God, and I don't know why Clive emphasized that so much. We didn't, we didn't discuss what we're going to be talking about. We think sometimes that, that, that being led by the Spirit is like how one would, would lead a dog on a leash. But that's not the leading of the spirit. Yes, I know there's, there's the principle of, of Caleb, that's the, a dog, obedient, just, would, just followed the master. But that's not the word here of, of being led by the spirit. When you analyze that word, to be led by the spirit, it means to be incited by the spirit. It means to be invigorated by the spirit. Uh, it means uh, to be energized by the Spirit, fueled by the Spirit of God. So it's not a passive exercise. This is active. To be led by the Spirit of God is to have every part of our being so filled with the Spirit, so connected to the Spirit. So can you see, you should pick up where I'm leading to. So at Genesis, when God formed man, right? We, we'll study that in more detail. Man was formed. Yes, there's words like created and there's words like made. But man was formed. But he only became a living being when the breath of God was put into him. At the fall, he lost that, became a fleshly being. We're now living in the days of the infilling, the leading of the Spirit of God so that we become that living divine beings again. Spiritual formation must take place inside of us to come to that place. Okay? It, it does, we've been through, I'm going to get a bit of, ahead of myself here now, but... I grew up in the Pentecostal move. I know what it is to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to speak in other tongues, but I can tell you that being spiritual does not mean being spirit-filled sometimes. There's still formations that must take place inside of us because when it comes to the Spirit of God, uh, the scriptures talk about the fullness of the Spirit. Sometimes we settled for half measure. Sometimes we settled for a portion. But the portion will never bring us into the likeness, to the image and the likeness of God. Because there's always a gap. We must pursue the fullness, the full formation of, of, of the Spirit of God inside of us. Okay? Like the scriptures uh, tell us, Ephesians 4, I think it is, um, where, where Paul says, I am in labor. It's as if I'm groaning for you until Christ is formed in you. So you see how formation comes in again. And I'm going to tie all of this up just now. Now, we, we, we must also just uh, look at the prophet Joel again and just give a little bit of context here. Because prophecies don't just exist in a vacuum. 
There's always a context to it. The prophet Joel is writing at a time when, when Israel experienced one of its most devastating natural disasters. A plague of locusts wiped out almost everything, everything. And um, you have to read this prophecy very, very, very carefully. But this is what, what happened. The land was hit with a plague of locusts. Now, these are devouring things. And by the way, it was like how we had COVID, and, and, and we settled on the fact that that was a judgment from God. The plague of locusts was a judgment that came over Israel at the time. Because when you read this carefully, God says, I sent my army, the army of locusts, all right? And it wiped out everything. They say that these types of, of locusts, and you know, um, when w the, 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 the swarm of locusts is so huge that when it flies past the sun, it looks like an eclipse is taking place. Because it could be like hundreds of millions of them. That's how big the swarm is. They say that they can eat 80 tons of food in a day. That's how much of crop. This entire swarm will, will fly over trees, and when they come out on the other side, there's not a leaf on the tree. That's how devastating this was. Okay? And after that army, when you read further in Joel 2, now it speaks about a human army that comes and invades the land. Okay? And by all um, evidence, it's probably the Babylonian army. And then the prophet says, that God will restore the land. He restores the crops. He makes the land fruitful again. He will heal the land. And then after the healing of the land, that's where this part of the scripture starts, where it says, it will come about after this. So after the healing of the land comes the healing of the people. And how does he heal the people? by filling them with the Spirit of God, by the outpouring of the Spirit of God. You understand that? He'll heal the land and heal the man. Just like in Adam, he created everything first, the animal kingdom, the vegetation, and all of that, and then he put the man in there. Everything fell, creation got mixed up and destroyed because of the fall. This is a similar picture we're seeing here in, uh, through the prophet Joel. The land gets healed and then the people get healed. But it's important to notice how they get healed through the outpouring of the Spirit. Now that's the days we're living in. The days of the outpouring of the Spirit. So the scripture that I just uh, quoted, Galatians 4.19, um, from the New King James Version. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again, until Christ is formed in you. And the word here is the word uh, morpho, from where we get morphology or metamorphosis, a change of form, or shape. What's important to remember here is that it is not, although the word says until Christ is formed in you, we have to read it correctly. It's not that Christ is being gradually formed in us, because Christ is complete. He is complete, okay? I'll read for you from Colossians chapter 1. We don't need to put this on the board. Just, just listen very, very carefully. Colossians chapter 1 gives us a very, very good description of the Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Mark those words, right? All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, 
the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. The fullness. So Christ can never ever be part. He is full. He is all in all. So what is being formed here now in Galatians 4.19? When we read this in the right context, it's not Christ being formed, but we, through the process of being transformed, reformed, conformed to his image, that we go through the process of being shaped and formed. But we can stop that process. We can resist that process. We can object to the process. We can stall the process. By how? By, by bringing our human nature in. So when there's the formation of Christ in us, the formation of the spirit, but the spirit and the flesh are at enmity with each other, guess who backs out? The spirit. Because he's a gentleman. He's a dove. He doesn't put up a fight. You understand? We have to be active in suppressing the flesh. All those things that was read today, the envy, the strife, the slandering, all of those things, we have to pull that out and then give space for the spirit to be formed inside of us. Can you see how it works? See how it works? Okay. So we will be and, 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 and it's not an easy process sometimes. That formation is not always an easy process. Um, sometimes we have to be panel beaten into a form. You know, a, a panel beater will, will work on a car um, with, with pieces of metal and his hammer and will, will knock and knock and knock and knock and knock until a dent comes out. That's how we have to be formed sometimes that we'll be panel beaten into, into formation. And this is a spiritual formation that is taking place inside of us. So family, there has to be a spiritual formation that must take place in each one of us. The Holy Spirit must be the centrality, the driving force, the operating system, the spiritual intelligence, um, our spiritual compass, for formation to take place. He's our helper, our advocate, the parakletos um, is what the scripture will call him. You see, a lot of our problems, a lot of our problems should not have occurred or a lot of our problems will disappear if we give more credence to spiritual formation in our lives. A lot of our problems will go away. Um, pain, disappointment, hurt. If we just give more attention to spiritual formation and the things of the spirit inside of us, there would not be room for the flesh to wreak any havoc in us. These are battles that sometimes we're fighting and they are self-inflicted uh, battles leading to self-inflicted scars. A lot of that will go. There's no one Absolutely no one, not, not your spouse, not children, children, not your, your parents, not your manager at work, not even your worst enemy, that vindictive person, you know, who says they've got a knife in my, for me, I'm scared to turn my back. <laughs> You know that vindictive person, we call him the enemy. Nobody, not even that person, can take away your joy, your happiness, and your identity if you are full of the Holy Spirit. And this has not got nothing to do with talking in tongues. That's one aspect, one evidence. I'm talking about the fullness of God in you. That when you stand, you stand formed, fully formed. Like Adam before he fell was fully formed. God the Father said, let us make man in our image. And at his formation, there was also Christ. I read that portion of scripture for you that nothing was made without him. 
Everything was made through him and by him. So God the Father was there. God the Son was there. And when he was formed, then the Holy Spirit was blown into him. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit stood there in the fully formed Adam. Now we have to come back to that. We have to come back to that because what was formed became deformed. And spiritual formation will bring us back. For me, that's, that's my be-all and end-all debate about Trinity. I got no time to talk to anybody and debate into with anybody about the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, how can three be in one and blah, 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 blah. For me, the complete man is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in me. And the commission that was given now in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, was go and make disciples of all nations, doing what? Baptizing them in? The name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the, uh, and, and the Holy Spirit. Why? So full formation takes place again. But our battle is in the area of the Spirit. We need to become spiritually formed so that the battle of the flesh is not our battle anymore. Okay. And you may ask, but how, how, how then is this possible? How, how is it that, that my enemy... This person who's taunting me, this neighbor, and we've got big issues with, with this person, or this colleague at work, how is it that you're telling me that this person cannot take my joy away? Well, if you're full of the Holy Spirit, you'll speak the language of love. You remember that the teaching that was done, that when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, I found all of those people there who were so diverse and all of different languages, but they started to speak a language that each one could understand. How? Through the Spirit. Through the Spirit. And in our context, the one language that we're going to speak that everyone will understand is that language of love. And that language of love will be so powerful, just like it was on, on, um, on the, uh, the, the day of Pentecost, that it bewildered these people. They could not fathom it. They could not understand it. Your enemies will be bewildered in that way. So much so that they'll start to love you. So much so that that healing will start to take place in communities, in environments. Can you see how the Holy Spirit works? It's not just about falling down. It's not about experiences. The, 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 uh, I, I mentioned about you know, the Pentecostal move of the Holy Spirit, and it's a legitimate move. It was a legitimate move. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But if we're still there, we are so caught up in the experience of the Holy Spirit that we missed another part, which is the, and I always have a problem pronouncing this word, the apostolicity of the Holy Spirit, the authenticity. Why was he sent in the first place? Can you see? Now we need to come back to that. An apostolic understanding of the Holy Spirit. And it will transform our lives. It will transform the church of the living God. The church will break out in such a way. If, we, if, if the early church, that church of Acts, saw 3,000 getting saved on one day and 5,000 getting saved on another day, what's happening with us? What's happening with us? Because we're still stuck in the experience. You see? Let's come back to an apostolic understanding, an original understanding of it. It'll be so strong that your enemies will stop hating you. They will stop hating you. Relationships will be healed. Marriages will be healed instantly. We will see, just like again from the, the book of Acts, how, how a new social order was created on the earth where economics didn't mean anything anymore. Wealth didn't mean anything. There was no difference between the rich and the poor. A new order was created. Why can't we see it happening in our time? Because we're not giving enough opportunity for spiritual formation to take place in us. The flesh still wants to fight. Opinion still wants to come in. Past hurts still want to come in. All of those things, and there's no spiritual formation taking place. 
The Holy Spirit in his fullness cannot only unify two individuals, heal a relationship between you and your enemy or you and your spouse or whatever. The Holy Spirit in his fullness can unify nations. Imagine the, the, the Jews and the Gentiles who were at enmity with each other. There was hatred. Suddenly in the whole, the rest of the book of Acts, Paul gives his whole life to, to saying, I am sent to the Gentiles. A Jew of all Jews. Nobody could be more Jewish than him. Gives his whole life to the Gentiles. And suddenly we see nations coming together. I mean, different nations, we're talking one language. Nations come. Can you see the power of spiritual formation inside of us? That we can become a catalyst. The church can be a catalyst to bring nations together. You know, one of the things we can never understand is, is, is this, this, this war in the Middle East, this Israel-Palestinian war. I mean, sometimes, yes, it is a war. People die and missiles are being shot, but sometimes it's so ludicrous that it's a war fought with throwing stones. They actually throw stones at each other. It's, it's, it looks like it's so foolish, and it's over a piece of land that's probably the size of Gauteng. Imagine if they knew the Holy Spirit. That war would be over. Those two nations that started as, as brothers would embrace each other. Imagine that. But they don't know the Holy Spirit. And so fighting will continue and killing will continue and hatred and racial prejudice and all of those things will continue. But let's not focus too much on, on that level. It's a large-scale effect. That's a large-scale effect when the spirit is absent. Let's focus on the personal level of how emotional healing can take place, physical healing, mental healing can take place when, when spiritual formation takes place inside of us, when we stop thinking like, like we're still made of dust. But start thinking like the Spirit of God was blown into us. And you know, to do that, we must also re-look at um, the, our, our concept of, of, of born again. I want to read, read John chapter 3. Um, we can put that up with the uh, NASB. NASB, yeah. So John chapter 3 is, uh, is Jesus and Nicodemus. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we normally stopped with our understanding of born again there. And we're related to our experience of coming to the Lord, being born again, if we've had that experience. Then Nicodemus, in his natural mind, said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now Nicodemus, uh, a learned person, comes to Jesus and this, this discussion takes place. Nicodemus means, his name means victory among the people or victory for the people. There's a number of variations there, right? So listen to this now. Nicodemus, which means victory for the people and he's a ruler. Can you see how subtle this is? Here's a man who thinks in the flesh. Look at his questioning, right? Here's a man who thinks through, through, through the lenses of the flesh. He's talking to Jesus. He acknowledges how great Jesus is. He acknowledges that he's from God, but he cannot understand this whole concept of being born again. 
because he asked the question, how can a man be born again? And he means victory for the people. Can you see what a false sense of security the flesh can give you? That the people will look at him because he was a ruler and they'll say to him, there's our victory. Our victory is in him or in his grouping or in his affiliation, but there's no spirit in him. He doesn't know what it is to be born of water and of the spirit. And he means victory for the people. That is, that is deception. That is fooling us. That is, that is creating a false sense of victory and security. And that false sense lies in, in the flesh. But we have, to have, we have to become spiritually formed. We have to have the, the spirit of God inside of us. So when we are born again, your born again experience was not just the day you gave your heart to the Lord and say, I'm born again. Now it's okay, we use that phrase. Nothing wrong with it. But think a little bit more. Push yourself a little bit more. And we have to ask ourselves, have I been born of water and of the spirit? That's what it means to be born again. Now we must also take this word again and look at it. Because Nicodemus' question was his response as, I was born once, now how do I get born again? Again, thinking from the natural. But when you look at, at, at the word again and do a word study on it, it doesn't mean to be born the second time. The word deutero, second time round. It actually means to be born from above. Go and do the word study on it. So he says... Jesus was saying, unless you are born from above, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. You have to be born, not again second time, but born from above. Your birth was earthly. Now you need to be born from above, from a heavenly dimension, from a heavenly perspective, a new birth. And in a new birth, that's how we become the new generation on the earth full of the Spirit of God. Okay. So let, let's just, I've got about 17 minutes. Let's just look at the word formation again from a biblical perspective. We'll try to round it up. In Genesis 2 verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Okay. Now, you know that there's, and, and I'm sure I mentioned this previously, others would have mentioned it, that there's two creation accounts given to us in the book of Genesis. There's one in Genesis chapter 1, there's one in Genesis chapter 2. They both complement each other very well. Genesis chapter 1 gives a broad overview of creation, and it'll throw out a, a statement like, God created. When you go to Genesis chapter 2, it gives a little bit more detail Okay, so while in Genesis 1 it says God made man or God created man, and a very interesting thing, thing to do is, is to look and study all the verbs that are used um, in, in, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Uh, the action words, right? Those are verbs, action words. God created, God said, God called. When he said let there be light, he called the light something, and he called the lesser light something. Um, what else did he do? God planted. He planted a garden called Eden. God placed. He took man and, and, and placed him in that garden. So all these verbs here are, are very packed and we must start to unpack it and we will, we'll get more information out of it. But when we come to Genesis chapter 2, a very interesting word, Genesis 2, 7. It says, and the Lord God formed. Now there's three points here that I want to make very, very quickly with this. First point is, throughout Genesis chapter 1, it will only say God. God created. God said. God. When we come to Genesis chapter 2, we are introduced to Lord God. That's not an insignificant change, right? So all of Genesis chapter 1, it will just be Elohim. 
That's the word used for God, Elohim. But in Genesis chapter 2, it's Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God. Now you have to think back to our Easter weekend services and, and, and the teaching that was done by Pastor Randolph on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Okay? So remember God said, let us make man in our own image. The plural. Now you'll see how in formation here, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, God the Father was there, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Because now when we talk about the Lord God, this is the pre-incarnate Christ, the Word. Remember that portion of Scripture that we read? Nothing was made without Him. Everything was made through Him. Here He is now. So God will say, let us create man. But when it came to him being formed, formed, the pre-incarnate Christ was there. That's how man was made in the image and likeness of God. Okay? And the word formed, the word formed, that's the second, that was the first point, right? From Lord, oh, sorry, from God to Lord God. And, and the second uh, point that I want to make here is on that word formed, which is the word yatsa. And what it means is to be squeezed into shape. So we were squeezed into form, into shape. And, and it's, not, uh, the, the, uh, it's not a direct English translation, so it's not like squeezing a rag or squeezing a sponge or something like that. It's the picture of, of a pottery maker, the wheel, you know, the potter's wheel. The same thing that, that God asked Jeremiah to go, and, to go and look at. That we were like, like this clay, like a lump of clay. And then the potter will put both his hands around it. And he'll squeeze this thing while the wheel is turning. And he'll squeeze it into shape. And two things will determine the shape. One is the image that he has in his mind of what he wants this vessel to look like. And the second thing is the skill of his hands. It can't be squeezed too much, it'll get destroyed. You're too light, it won't take its shape. And with the gentle movement of his fingers, this clay starts to take shape into a vessel. Can you see the thought, the effort that went into us being formed? <laughs> it was a one, it, it's one of those things where where the Godhead was, was actually involved in our formation. So when I talk about spiritual formation, it's not going to be some like, easy process. Okay? Neither is it going to be impossible to achieve. But we have to get this word formation into us, into how we were created. We were formed. We were squeezed into shape. Into, as I said, two things. What the maker, the potter, wanted to to create, so he had, a, he had something in his mind, and then the skill of his hand made it. And when it was finished, he said, it is very good. It is the best out of all of creation. It is so good that I can now put my breath into it. And man became a living being. That is formation. That is for me. I like to believe that God worked so hard on us on the sixth day that that's why he needed to rest on the seventh day. He put in some effort, yeah. <laughs> he really put in effort. He didn't cut any corners with us. He didn't. He, shaped, he formed us. He took something. He took an effort, took planning. He formed us. You see, all of creation, everything that was made before that, will always bear the signature of God. His creative signature will be in it but never his DNA. That's only for us. That, that mark, that DNA, the nature was only put into us when he formed us. Nothing else carries that. There's a, there's a view in this world of people who, who have not yet come to that realization, who believe that the manifestation of God is in nature. They are misled. Yes, you can marvel at nature sometimes, but, but, but that's called a pantheistic view where we think that, the, that, that, that God is manifested 
in, in, in the material world around us. No, he's not manifested in the material world. God's only intent for manifestation is through that which he formed, which is us, which is us. And we messed it up. So we now have to go through spiritual formation to come back to that place, okay? And all of the work has been done again. All of the work has been done through him, through the cross, through the sending of the promise. You've got to look at the parallels between Genesis and what happened in the book of, of Acts. There was a creation that took place in Genesis. There was a creation of a nation that took place in the book of Acts. There was the breathing into man in the book of Genesis, the ruach of God. There was the breath of God that came into the, into the, the upper room. You understand? We have to look at all of these, these parallels. Um, and, and, and when God created man, okay, man was now the interface between the material world and the spiritual world. Now we have to come back to being that interface. We must come back. The church of God is, call, is called to be that interface. We cannot only be material-driven, material-minded. God does not recognize that. Spiritual formation must take place. So we are now being reformed. Reformation is taking place. And reformation must take place or else we will remain as dust of the earth and not son of God. See, there's a difference there. Formed from the dust, but sonship through the spirit being breathed into us. That's how Adam was called a son of God. So if you minus the spirit, what happens? You go back to status of dust. Okay, the dust of the earth. Now we don't want to be the dust of the earth. God wants to form us again as a spiritual formation must start to take place inside of us. Everything that resulted, um, that caused the fall and then perpetuated on the earth, things that we call the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, pride of life, everything must now get submitted back to the Spirit of God. It must bow to the Spirit of God. Okay. And, and then we go through this formation. And, and if we want to be clay in the potter's hands, you have to be pliable clay, isn't it? We have to be workable. We can't be stubborn clay, stony clay, because then he'll reject that clay, because it can't become what's in his mind anymore. You can have all the skill in the hand, but that's not what I want. I want the perfect vessel to be created again. I want the perfect man to be created again. So we have to be the clay in the potter's hand that can become that vessel. Jesus himself went through formation. Uh, he went through circumcision. He had to go through baptism, even though he didn't have to be baptized. He fasted, he prayed, um, he was tempted. He went through all of those, he went through sufferings and, and, and out of absolute obedience, he went through the cross. And all of that was for Jesus, the man, to be on his journey of formation into the Christ so that he fits the profile of the pre-incarnate Christ, that which was existing from the beginning. Okay, so we now have to, to, to start thinking differently of the Spirit of God and of, on, and of formation taking place in us. Yes, baptism in the Spirit, absolute, absolutely needful. We must be baptized in the Spirit of God. But being baptized in the Spirit, having the fullness of the Spirit uh, is our end goal, is the end goal. That's the most important thing. Why? So that then we can be led by the Spirit of God. We can be led into everything in life, every decision in life. To be led by the Spirit is to align the, free, to align the gift of free choice to the mind of God. Because a separation took place there. So we will always have free choice. We will never be turned into robots. We will never become that. It's not in the nature of God to have sons in that way. He wants sons who are obedient, not sons who are programmed. So we will always have free choice. 
but spiritual formation is coming to the place where we will align our free choice to the perfect will of God. The perfect man is then created. It's living a life that is totally aligned to heavenly patterns. It's living a life that always gives glory to God. It's coming into sonship and experiencing the highest relationship with God that we can while still living in the material world. And that highest relationship is sonship. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, Romans 8, 14, they are the sons of God. They are the sons of God. But how will we be led by the Spirit of God unless spiritual formation takes place inside of us? Unless we know what it is to be led, inspired, motivated, um, incited, galvanized by the Spirit of God. Yeah. So I'm going to just close there and let's just reflect, ask the Lord, do an, an introspection and ask ourselves if spiritual formation is taking place inside of us. Are we happy with just speaking in tongues? Um, because I think Paul wrote that um, where he said, if there's tongues, tongues will fail. If there's prophecy, prophecy will fail. You know, all of those things that we place so much of emphasis on, and we should. But he says, where all of that exists, but we don't have love, he says, all of that is then worth nothing. And the love that, that we've been talking about here can only come through formation of spirit inside of us. If there's one ounce of flesh still there, we'll never experience agape love. We'll never know what it is to love unconditionally. Only the Spirit of God can, do, can, can initiate that inside of us. You see, so we can use the word love and we can use it rather cheaply. Um, but to come to the place of love, the love that surpasses everything else, will only be done through the Spirit. The Spirit, why? Why? Because it's God's Spirit and God is love. Isn't it? God is a Spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in Spirit and in truth. So we know that God is a Spirit and we also know that God is love. So put it all together. If God is love, God is a Spirit and that Spirit is in you, only love will come out. Only love can come out right let's bow in prayer father we thank you today we thank you for your word and lord we want to become now like you formed adam with intent with purpose with design in mind lord we want to be spiritually formed into your image and into your likeness again into that exact representation, into that perfect man, into being the Christ on the earth, Lord. So help us in our weaknesses today. Help us to remove the blockages today. Help us, O oh God, to overcome the barriers of the flesh. And so your spirit to be inside of us, for us to have the fullness of your spirit inside of us, Lord. It's all we want. And everything else will start to fall into place. We will love unconditionally. We will never look at another person through the eyes of the flesh again. We will look at everybody through the lenses of Christ. We will choose our words more carefully. That we will never utter words that, that we will want to take back that we will regret saying but that we will truly come to the place where out of the abundance of the heart the mouth will speak and if the heart is full of your spirit then only spirit words and hymns and songs will come out of us Lord words that will encourage and not discourage words that will build up and not break down for you count our very words that we speak 
So fill us with your spirit, Lord. We desire the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We desire to speak the language of love and care and concern and generosity. We desire to be more for our brothers than for ourselves. We desire to see others exceed even our abilities. We desire, O oh God, to live in, from a kingdom dimension and no more from the flesh, no more competitively and, and, and with pettiness inside of us, but to live and think from an eternal and a heavenly dimension and, and live with days of heaven on earth now, Lord. The world will never understand this. Lord, we are still trying to comprehend this, but we know what we want. We've set our eye on the mark and we will not turn back, Lord. May we lay our lives before you. May we come before you, Lord, with, with the flint knife to say, Lord, circumcise the flesh. Remove the flesh from us so that we can stand before you spirit to spirit now and that we can reach in and extract the deeper things of God that you have prepared for us. Things that are stored up in heavenly places that we just cannot access because we're still in the flesh and we are not using the keys of the kingdom which you have given to us. Father, we want all of us to progress at the same pace, at the same rate in our quest for you, Lord. Let no one be left behind. But may we progress as a company, pursuing the heart and the mind of God. May we desire you more than anything else, more than anything else in this world.